Even though we cannot meet together to have a church service, our God is still the God who meets with us in his beautiful grace. The God who gives rest to the weary, comfort to those who mourn, strength to the weak, love to the unloved, and grace to sinners in Christ is still with us, his people, even though we can't be together as his people. Um, if this is your first time, then, uh, or if you're checking us out online, then I want to extend an especially warm welcome. Uh, it's wonderful that you can uh, join us online. We'll get right into it with our call to worship. If I could ask you to open your Bibles to Psalm 147. Psalm 147 is our call to worship for this evening, and I'll give you a moment to turn there. <clears throat> Psalm 147, reading from verse 1. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the numbers of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him. And those who hope in his steadfast love. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. For he strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. He makes peace in your borders. He fills you with the finest of the wheat. He sends at his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters frost like ashes. He hurls down his crystals of ice like crumbs. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. He makes his wind blow and the waters flow. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and rules to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his rules. Praise the Lord. Let's respond now to the reading of God's word with song. Let us sing together the church's one foundation.
Thank you, Emma. Well, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for your grace in reaching us through this technology with your word to hear from you, to be shepherded by you, to be fed by you. Father, we thank you that you feed us with the finest of the wheat. And we thank you that you do that not only physically, but spiritually. You feed us with fat and rich food. And you do so through your word. Father, we pray that you would feed us this evening. We pray that, Father, you would feed us with the truth. We thank you that it's through knowing the truth that we are set free. We thank you that it's through knowing the truth that we are given joy and peace. And so, Father, we pray that we would come to know the truth in an even deeper way this evening. We pray that, Father, you would correct us where we have wrong thoughts about you, wrong thoughts about the Christian life, and that, Father, in their place, you would put true thoughts, true thoughts about you, true thoughts about the Christian life, true thoughts about how we should live in this life, in this fallen world. Father, lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake and seek. Grow us in our fear of you. May we be made more humble as a result of your work this evening through your word. May we be made more happy and more holy as well. Father, we pray again for our government. We pray that you would give them wisdom. We pray that you would continue to work in this difficult situation to bring about your will to glorify your name and to bless your people. Father, we pray for um, the suffering in our midst and the sick. We pray, Father, that even now they would know your comfort and that through your word this evening, they would be brought to um, trust more firmly and that all of us would be brought to trust more firmly in you and your love, your love that knows no bounds, your love from which we cannot be separated your love that knows no height, nor depth, nor breadth. Father, we thank you for your love. And we thank you that in your love, you sent your son to die for our sin. May we be refreshed in him this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. So before we turn to the text for this evening, I will sing one more hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
Thank you, Emma. So I invite you to uh, open your Bibles to our text for this evening. Our text for this evening is 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 16, verses 1 to 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 to 4. <clears throat> First Corinthians 16, 1 to 4. This is the word of the Lord. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive... I will send those whom you would credit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. Grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Before we turn to the Lord in the text, let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that each word in it is inspired by you for our good and your glory. We thank you that you have given us your word, every single part of it, to instruct us, to teach us, to minister your grace, that you might be glorified and we might be blessed. So, Father, do that this evening through this text. Open our eyes to behold wonderful things in it. Unite our hearts to fear your name. Feed us with fat and rich food, food that is needful to us and food that is wonderful Today. Father, bless us, the sick, shepherd us. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I wonder if you've ever had this experience. You're in conversation with someone, a fellow Christian. Could be about anything, but the person uses this line. God told me dot 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 has that ever happened to you someone tells you god told me i should marry her someone tells you god told me i should study that someone tells you god told me i should move there someone tells you god told me i should say that someone says to you god told me i should change church god told me god gave me a direct message a lot of Christians speak like that. Pentecostals, Baptists, Anglicans, Reformed. It's not just certain Christians who use the language of God told me. A lot of Christians speak like that. But what's interesting is this. Paul almost never spoke like that. Now, there are places in Acts and one place in Galatians you can point to as possible exceptions but my point is this you read through Paul's letters and he just doesn't give the impression that he lived his life or encouraged other Christians to live their lives on the basis of God told me dot 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 and we see that in our text for this evening and we'll cover it under three headings what Paul doesn't do what Paul does do and what we can learn. Firstly, what Paul doesn't do. You've all had this experience. There's a knock on the door. You open the door and the person standing there is collecting for a charity. So they explain some crisis or famine that's taken place in some part of the world and they ask you if you'd be willing to give. Paul is doing something similar here. A crisis of poverty has hit the Jerusalem church. Now, it's not clear exactly why. Some think it was their decision to have all things in common that we read about in Acts. In other words, that decision was a mistake and it's led them into poverty. Others think that it was a severe drought that began in AD 46 that lasted many years. In any case, Paul is circling the churches, Galatia, Corinth, collecting relief for the Jerusalem church. And I want to begin this evening by looking briefly 
perhaps not briefly, but we'll look at what Paul doesn't do. What Paul doesn't do. Firstly, notice this. Paul doesn't tell the Corinthians to ask God how much they should give. Notice that. I wonder if you've ever been encouraged to do that. The preacher says, time for the offering. I want you all to close your eyes and I want you all to ask God for a number. I want you to take a God told me approach to your giving. Ask God for a number. Ask God how much you should give. It might be a big number, but just ask him and then be obedient. Notice Paul doesn't do that here. Paul, as a pastor, doesn't take that approach to their giving. He doesn't take that approach to this aspect of their lives, the God told me approach. Not only that, though, God through Paul doesn't do that here. Remember, this is inspired. If God wanted the Corinthians to take a God told me approach to giving, in other words, if God wanted the Corinthians to ask him for a number, he could have inspired Paul to say that. But he didn't. In other words, Paul and God through Paul did not encourage the Corinthians to take a God told me approach to this aspect of their lives. He did not encourage the Corinthians to seek a direct message from him. Secondly, not only does Paul not encourage the Corinthians to take a God told me approach to this aspect of their lives, their giving, Paul didn't take a God told me approach to his own life. Paul didn't seek a direct message for himself as it related to his own decision making. Notice what Paul says in verse four. In verse four, Paul's talking about his future decision making process. The decision, should I go to Jerusalem or not? Look at Paul's decision making process. Verse four. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. Notice what Paul's decision-making process isn't. Paul doesn't say, if God tells me that I should go also, they will accompany me. Again, he could have said that. He could have taken that approach. And again, God could have inspired him to say that. God could have inspired him to take that approach, but he didn't say that. Instead, he says, if it seems advisable. What does that mean? Well, this word advisable means worthy, fit, deserving, right. So how is Paul going to make this decision? He's going to examine the situation and say, is this advisable? Is this worthy? Is this fit? Is this right? He's not going to say, God, give me a message. He's going to say, is this advisable? Is this worthy? Is this fit? Is this right? In other words, Paul didn't take a God told me approach to the Christian life. He didn't approach his Christian life in that way. And I say that to say two things. Firstly, you don't have to approach the Christian life in that way. It can be very enslaving to live your life on the basis of trying to get messages from God. It can be very enslaving to take a God told me approach to the Christian life. And it's very liberating to actually see what the Bible teaches here. And what it teaches is this. You are completely free to make decisions on the basis of what you, in light of his word, deem advisable. Of course you pray, of course you seek the Lord, but what this text shows us is that we're free to make decisions on the basis of what we, in light of his word, deem advisable. And we seek the Lord and his word in that regard. But secondly, not only don't you have to approach the Christian life in this way, in terms of the God told me approach, you shouldn't approach the Christian life in this way. And I want to use an illustration here to make this point. The point that you shouldn't approach the Christian life in this way, in this God told me way. Imagine with me that you have a friend who is a man of few words. There's a TV series that Carol and I 
uh, really, really like. And the main character, his name is Walt, has this beautiful deep voice and he is a man of few words. So imagine with me that you have a friend like Walt. Now imagine with me that someone says to you, oh, I met your friend Walt the other day. He's got a very high voice, doesn't he? And he's very chatty, isn't he? I mean, he just talked and talked and talked and talked. Now, what do you say to that person? You say, well, whoever you were talking to, it definitely wasn't Walt. It definitely wasn't my friend because he doesn't speak like that. He's not really talkative. He doesn't have a high voice. You would say, he doesn't speak like that. Whoever you met, that's not him. This is the same. If the God revealed in the Bible does not ordinarily lead his people by direct private messages, it should trouble you if you ordinarily yourself lead your life by direct private messages. If the God revealed in the Bible does not ordinarily speak to his people in a still small voice in their hearts, it should trouble you if the God you serve ordinarily speaks to you in a still small voice in your heart. And I say that to say this, I am convinced that many Christians are going to come face to face with the God of the Bible at the end of time and realize that what they took to be the voice of God was in reality something else. So that's our first heading, what Paul doesn't do. Now our second heading, what Paul does do. I think there's one word to describe what Paul does do here, and it's the word wise. What I mean is, as you examine Paul's words here, as I did preparing for this, his thinking, the way he plans, what he directs the Corinthians to do, how he communicates, you see from multiple angles profound wisdom. Firstly, Paul is fair. Verse one. Notice Paul doesn't unfairly burden one church. He says, as I directed the churches of Galatia. And there's wisdom here. There's wisdom here. There's wisdom here in sharing out the loan. There's wisdom in not unfairly burdening one party, but in sharing the burden between many. Secondly, Paul is clear. Notice that Paul tells the Corinthians about this. So he's not just fair, he makes it clear that he's fair. Let's say Paul was fair. So he directed the Galatians as well. He, he didn't unfairly burden one church, but he shared the burden out among many. But let's say he didn't tell the Corinthians about that. So he shared the burden out with the Galatian church as well, but he doesn't tell the Corinthians. What might the Corinthians feel? They might feel unfairly burdened even though in reality they weren't unfairly burdened because the Galatian church was sharing the load, they might feel unfairly burdened and they might be reluctant to give as a result. But Paul wisely doesn't let them go there. Instead, he's clear. And there's wisdom here too, isn't there? There's wisdom in communicating clearly. There's wisdom in making sure other people know what's going on. It's the cliche. The biggest problem in relationships is communication, but it's true. And Paul shows us here the value of communicating clearly. Thirdly, Paul's extremely practical. So he's not only fair, he's not only clear, he's extremely practical. Look at verse two. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. Notice how practical Paul is here. Notice how practical this is as a solution. So it's a routine. It's a routine. In many ways, who we are and what we accomplish in life is simply the product of our weekly routine. And we see something of that here. Paul wants the Corinthians to be a giving church. And how does he pursue that? He doesn't pursue it through setting a lofty goal, but through creating a basic routine. He says, first day of every week, this is what you should do. You should put something aside. It's a routine. 
I read this recently in terms of routines. You do not rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. And there's wisdom in that. If we want to get somewhere in a year's time, whether it's being more generous with our money, more gentle with others, more knowledgeable, whatever it is, we get there, not through lofty goals, but by God's grace through basic routine. And we see some of that here. Following on from that, because it's a routine, it's both easy and effective. What's easier? Giving a large amount of money once or a smaller amount of money regularly. The second is easier, isn't it? Not only that, it's more effective, and you probably know this from experience. Think of charitable giving. Go back to what I said earlier. Someone knocks on your door. Give me $100 for said charity. You'll probably say no, but the same person says $2 a week. You'll probably say, oh, why not? 10 years later, probably forgotten all about that automatic payment. You've given not $100, but $1,000. And again, this reinforces the value of routine. It works because it's both easy relative to trying to seek lofty goals and effective. It actually gets you to achieve those goals. Not only that, though, in terms of the wisdom here, and this is really practical, it's safe. It's safe. What Paul advises here, it's not only easy and effective, it's also safe. Why is it the first day of the week that Paul selects? Well, I think the answer is that the money was put into a common treasury, which meant the money was probably far safer than it would have been if it was stored in people's houses. So I say all that to to say that we see wonderful practical wisdom here, don't we? Don't ever think that godliness is opposed to being wonderfully practical. Paul's a very godly man, and he strikes us here as what? Also being a very practical man to have around. And we see the same thing in Proverbs, don't we? Godliness and practicality are not only not opposed, they go hand in hand. Fourthly, though, Paul's not only practically wise, he's also people-wise. What I mean is he's wise in terms of people's perceptions. Look at me in verses three and four. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you would credit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. Paul's being conscientious here, isn't he? To use a modern term, he's doing things in a way that's above board. Paul doesn't say, Give me the money and trust me that I'll take it to Jerusalem. Now, of course, Paul could be trusted to take the money to Jerusalem. He's the last person on earth to steal from the church, but he doesn't say that. Instead, he says, Corinthians, choose some people in the congregation you can trust, accredit them by letter, have it written out, I'll send them when I come, and if it seems advisable, I'll go with them. In other words, do things in a way that no one is going to be able to look at how things are carried out and suspect any wrongdoing. And again, there's wisdom here. It's not only important to do the right thing, but to be seen to be doing the right thing. But then notice this as well. He's not just people-wise in terms of people's perceptions, but also in terms of making connections. Look at this. Paul advises things to be conducted in such a way that a personal connection is formed between the Corinthian church and the Jerusalem church. He says, you need to go. Some of you need to go. Those of you who are accredited by letter needs to go. And think about how wonderful it would be for that personal connection between the churches to be established. By having the Corinthians deliver their gift in person, that is what Paul is establishing, a personal connection. And again, there's wisdom here. Even if it's more inconvenient, even if it's more expensive, we should place a priority on doing things that creates, in a way that creates a personal connection. Think of John's words. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon and we will talk face to face. So these are profoundly wise words in so many ways, they're fair, they're clear, they're practically wise, they're people wise, 
They're just filled with wisdom. Now, in terms of application, I want to move straight to our last heading, what we can learn. What have we seen this evening? Well, we've seen that Paul very simply didn't take the God told me approach to the Christian life. Instead, what we've seen is profound wisdom on his part. And so what can we learn from that? Well, we can learn that we shouldn't take the God told me approach to the Christian life. Instead, we should take the wisdom approach. What does Proverbs say? Proverbs doesn't say private direct messages about what to do are better than jewels. No, it says wisdom is better than jewels and all that you may desire cannot compare with it. We see wisdom here in Paul. And if we want to be biblical, we shouldn't seek direct messages at, at every turn. We should seek wisdom at every turn, at every turn. As wisdom says in Proverbs 8, blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors. But as we close, I want to ask the question, where does this wisdom come from? Where does this profound and profoundly practical wisdom, the wisdom we see in Paul, where does it come from? The reason I want to ask that is that there's a temptation with a sermon like this to say, okay, Paul was fair, Paul was clear, Paul was practically wise, Paul was people wise. I need to do those things too. I need that wisdom. Give me that wisdom. In fact, some are obsessed with gaining that kind of wisdom. In fact, some of the Corinthians were possibly obsessed with gaining that kind of wisdom. Remember, that was one of the things they were obsessed with, wisdom, but they missed the boat, didn't they? And today, many Christians want practical wisdom. Give me practical wisdom. Give me something I can apply, something I can take away. And those takeaways are really helpful, but wisdom doesn't begin with those takeaways. It doesn't begin with those practical points of application. They can help. They do help. But wisdom doesn't begin. So I want to ask the question as we close, how is it that Paul ended up being so profoundly wise? A wisdom we see come through in these verses. The answer is something deeply impractical. The answer is the fear of the Lord. What does Proverbs say the beginning of wisdom is? It says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. In other words, if you want wisdom, it doesn't start with knowing a technique or a practical takeaway or a practical point of application. It starts with knowing and fearing the Lord. In other words, it starts with your character. And that's what we see coming through here. In these verses, we just see Paul's character shining through. In a sense, Paul couldn't help but be this wise because that's who he was. And I want to close by giving an illustration. Some of you younger folk might not know who Fred Astaire was, but he was a film star known for being an amazing dancer. And there's this wonderful interview with Fred Astaire um, where he's kind of doing a tour of his house. And I remember sharing it with someone and, and they made a wonderful comment. They said this about Fred Astaire. They said, even the way he walks is like dancing. It's a wonderful comment. Even the way he walks is like dancing. But it actually goes quite deep. Fred Astaire could not do something as ordinary as walking from point A to point B without expressing his character, without it coming through, without it shining through. And there's a sense in which that's what's happening here. In these verses, Paul's character, his fear of the Lord, is simply being expressed in this profound wisdom, which brings us to the gospel. 
What does it mean to fear the Lord? Well, according to our call to worship, fearing the Lord means hoping in his steadfast love. So if you want to be wise, practically wise, if you want to show the wisdom that Paul shows here, if you want to live well and give generously, the answer is to is not to live your life trying to get new messages from God and taking the God told me approach to the Christian life. The answer is to go back to the old message of God's love in Christ and him crucified. For as Paul told the Corinthians earlier, because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us what? Wisdom from God righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that as it is written let the one who boasts boast in the lord let's pray now heavenly father we pray that you would grow us in our fear of you we pray that you would help us to hope only in your steadfast love and that as a result of fearing you we would walk in wisdom practical wisdom Wisdom that benefits our neighbor. Wisdom that enables us to do deeds of love for them, for your glory and their good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to close this evening with one final hymn, When Peace Like a River.
that Ahimu was able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. So just a reminder, we have the Tuesday night meeting, 7.30 on Zoom. Um, if I don't see you there, then hopefully see you here next week. Thank you.